Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 20 The season developed and matured. Another year's instalment of flowers, leaves, nightingales, thrushes, finches, and such ephemeral creatures took up their positions where only a year ago others had stood in their place, when these were nothing more than germs and inorganic particles. Rays from the sunrise drew forth the buds and stretched them into long stalks, lifted up sap in noiseless streams, opened petals, and sucked out secrets in invisible jets and breathings. Dairyman Crick's household of maids and men lived on comfortably, placidly, even merrily. Their position was perhaps the happiest of all positions in the social scale, being above the line at which neediness ends, and below the line at which the conveniences begin to cramp natural feeling, and the stress of threadbare modishness makes too little of enough. Thus passed the leafy time, when arborescence seems to be the only thing aimed at out of doors. Tess and Clare unconsciously studied each other, ever balanced on the edge of a passion, yet apparently keeping out of it. All the while they were converging under an irresistible law, as surely as two streams in one vale. Tess had never in her recent life been so happy as she was now. Possibly never would be so happy again. She was, for one thing, physically and mentally suited among these new surroundings. The sapling, which had rooted down to a poisonous stratum on the spot of its sowing, had been transplanted to a deeper soil. Moreover, she, and Clare also, stood as yet on the debatable land between predilection and love, where no profundities have been reached, no reflections have set in, awkwardly inquiring, whither does this new current tend to carry me? What does it mean to my future? How does it stand towards my past? Tess was the merest stray phenomenon to Angel Clare as yet, a rosy, warming apparition, which had only just acquired the attribute of persistence in his consciousness. So he allowed his mind to be occupied with her, deeming his preoccupation to be no more than a philosopher's regard of an exceeding novel, fresh, and interesting specimen of womankind. They met continually. They could not help it. They met daily in that strange and solemn interval the twilight of the morning, in the violet or pink dawn, for it was necessary to rise early, so very early, here. Milking was done betimes, and before the milking came the skimming, which began at a little past three. It usually fell to the lot of some one or other of them to wake the rest, the first being aroused by an alarm clock and, as Tess was the latest arrival, and they soon discovered that she could be depended upon not to sleep through the alarm as the others did, this task was thrust most frequently upon her. No sooner had the hour of three struck and whizzed than she left her room and ran to the dairyman's door, then up the ladder to Angel's, calling him in a loud whisper, then woke her fellow dairymaids. By the time that Tess was dressed, Clare was downstairs and out in the humid air. The remaining maids and the dairyman usually gave themselves another turn on the pillow, and did not appear until a quarter of an hour later. The grey half-tones of daybreak are not the grey half-tones of the day's clothes, though the degree of their shade may be the same. In the twilight of the morning light seems active, darkness passive. In the twilight of evening it is the darkness which is active and crescent, and the light which is the drowsy reverse. Being so often, possibly not always by chance, the first two persons to get up at the dairy-house, they seemed to themselves the first persons up of all the world. In these early days of her residence here Tess did not skim, 
but went out of doors at once after rising, where he was generally awaiting her. The spectral, half-compounded, aqueous light which pervaded the open mead impressed them with a feeling of isolation, as if they were Adam and Eve. At this dim, inceptive stage of the day, Tess seemed to Clare to exhibit a dignified largeness, both of disposition and physique, an almost regnant power, possibly because he knew that at that preternatural time hardly any woman so well endowed in person as she was likely to be walking in the open air within the boundaries of his horizon. Very few in all England. Fair women are usually asleep at midsummer dawns. She was close at hand, and the rest were nowhere. The mixed, singular, luminous gloom in which they walked along together to the spot where the cows lay often made him think of the resurrection hour. He little thought that the Magdalene might be at his side. Whilst all the landscape was in neutral shade, his companion's face, which was the focus of his eyes, rising above the mist stratum, seemed to have a sort of phosphorescence about it. She looked ghostly, as if she were merely a soul at large. In reality, her face, without appearing to do so, had caught the cold gleam of day from the northeast. His own face, though he did not think of it, wore the same aspect to her. It was then, as has been said, that she impressed him most deeply. She was no longer the milkmaid, but a visionary essence of woman, a whole sex condensed into one typical form. He called her Artemis Demeter, and other fanciful names half-teasingly, which she did not like, because she did not understand them. "'Call me Tess,' she would say, askance, and he did. Then it would grow lighter, and her features would become simply feminine. They had changed from those of a divinity who could confer bliss to those of a being who craved it. At these non-human hours they could get quite close to the waterfowl. Herons came with a great bold noise as of opening doors and shutters, out of the boughs of a plantation which they frequented at the side of the mead, or, if already on the spot, hardily maintained their standing in the water, as the pair walked by, watched them by moving their heads round in a slow, horizontal, passionless wheel, like the turn of puppets by clockwork. They could then see the faint summer fogs in layers, woolly, level, and apparently no thicker than counterpanes, spread about the meadows in detached remnants of small extent. On the grey moisture of the grass were marks where the cows had lain through the night, dark green islands of dry herbage the size of their carcasses, in a general sea of dew. From each island proceeded a serpentine trail by which the cow had rambled away to feed after getting up, at the end of which they found her, the snoring puff from her nostrils when she recognized them, making an intenser little fog of her own amid the prevailing one. Then they drove the animals back to the barton, or sat down to milk them on the spot, as the case might require. Or perhaps the summer fog was more general and their meadows lay like a white sea, out of which the scattered trees rose like dangerous rocks. Birds would soar through it into the upper radiance, and hang on the wing sunning themselves, or a light on the wet rails subdividing the mead, which now shone like glass rods. Minute diamonds of moisture from the mist hung, too, upon Tess's eyelashes, and drops upon her hair like seed-pearls. When the day grew quite strong and commonplace, these dried off her. Moreover, Tess then lost her strange and ethereal beauty. Her teeth, lips, and eyes scintillated in the sunbeams, and she was again the dazzlingly fair dairymaid only, who had to hold her own against the other women of the world. About this time they would hear Dairyman Crick's voice lecturing the non-resident milkers for arriving late, 
and speaking sharply to old Deborah Fyander for not washing her hands. "'For heaven's sake, pop thy hands under the pump, Deb. Upon my soul, if the London folk only knowed of thee and thy slovenly ways, they'd swallow their milk and butter more mincingly than they do already, and that's saying a good deal.' The milking proceeded, till towards the end Tess and Clare, in common with the rest, could hear the heavy breakfast-table dragged out from the wall in the kitchen by Mrs. Crick this being the invariable preliminary to each meal, the same horrible scrape accompanying its return journey when the table had been cleared. End of chapter 20